Okay, so next, uh, I'd like to sketch an uh, application to strong dynamics. And so the anomalies of global symmetry is very useful because of what is called two hoofed anomaly matching condition. This two hoofed anomaly matching condition uh, states the following. So suppose that we have some UV theory, and suppose that this UV theory has some global symmetry, which I denote by F. Now, uh, by RG flow, it goes to infrared, and there we get something. But if the theory is very strongly coupled, then we don't know what happens in the infrared in strongly coupled theory. And I didn't write it here, but actually, uh, it, it can be reversed. In, if you consider some higher dimensional uh, supersymmetric uh, superconformal field theory, sometimes this IR theory is weakly coupled, but the UV theory is very, very strongly coupled without any Lagrangian description. So in that case, it, this UV and IR are reversed in higher dimensional uh, superconformal field theories. But in any case, uh, this two-foot anomaly matching uh, states that the anomaly of this global symmetry in UV must be the same as the anomaly of uh, uh, global symmetry in the IR. So in other words, the two-foot anomaly matching says that the anomalies are conserved under the RG flow. So anomalies are conserved quantities. So why? Why the anomalies must be conserved? <coughs> I give an argument which is slightly different from the original argument of two hoofed. It's essentially the same as original argument of two hoofed. But let me discuss it. So first, let's recall that the anomalous theories are realized on a boundary of topological phase. So in the bulk, we have topological phase and anomalous theory, such as chiral fermions, are realized on the boundary. OK? Then, then we have this situation. <clears throat> the boundary theory flows from UV theory to IR theory under the RG flow. However, this bulk theory, the bulk topological phase in one higher dimensions, this theory has a large mass gap. I said that uh, this theory has no dynamical degrees of freedom. So this topological phase is a almost trivial theory. So this has large mass gap, and therefore this is invariant under RG flow. So the UV and IR anomalies are controlled by the same bulk topological phase. So therefore the anomaly must be conserved. These two are UV and IR are described by the same uh, topological phase. So this completes the proof of the uh, conservation of the anomaly. And this two-hoofed anomaly matching is very useful in the studies of strong dynamics, such as QCD. And two-hoofed discussed the case of QCD. This QCD is uh, most important uh, case in particle physics. So let me review that two-fifths argument. In QCD, uh, there exist perturbative triangle anomalies of chiral symmetries. So this SUNF left acts on the left-handed quarks. They rotate the left-handed quarks. And this SUNF right uh, rotates the right-handed quarks. And so <coughs> these symmetries have this triangle anomaly. This is very familiar triangle anomaly. So this means that if we gauge these uh, chiral symmetries, then this triangle anomaly would give an anomaly. Uh, this triangle diagram would give an anomaly. And this anomaly has a very powerful uh, implications. In the UV, we have quarks, which have 
to prove the anomaly of chiral symmetry. Now, suppose that the theory confines in the IR. And then, after confinement, if there is no chiral fermion to match the anomaly, then the chiral symmetry must be spontaneously broken. So we can conclude this from the anomaly matching. Because if there is no chiral fermion, then we cannot match the anomaly by fermions. And we cannot match the anomaly by bosons if the symmetry is not spontaneously broken. So the symmetry must be spontaneously broken. If the symmetry is spontaneously broken, then we can match the anomaly by using the Pessimino Witten term of uh, uh, Goldstone bosons. The simple case is uh, given by uh, uh, color number which is even. So suppose that the color number is even. Then all gauge invariant composite fields are bosons. Because uh, if we try to construct a uh, color singlet state, they are all bosons if this color number is even. So there is no fermion after confinement. So therefore, uh, we conclude that the chiral symmetry must be broken if the theory is in confinement phase. If this NC is odd, then we need more complicated discussions. Uh, but uh, depending on the value of the color and flavor numbers, uh, we may be able to give a similar argument. So this two-hoofed anomaly matching gives a very important relation between the two most important concepts in QCD, namely confinement and chiral symmetry breaking. So QCD is obviously a very important theory in particle physics, and confinement and chiral symmetry breaking are obviously very, very important concepts in QCD. And two anomaly matching gives the relation between them. So, so this is the reason that uh, people like uh, two-foot anomaly. So two-foot anomaly is really powerful in the study of strong dynamics. Now, how about uh, other theories? For example, pi Amir's theories, and pi n equal one super Amir's theories, and so on. In the case of pi Amir's theory and pi n equal one super Amir's theory, we don't have any continuous symmetries. And pi Amir's theory don't even have fermions. So, if we only look at the perturbative anomalies, then there seems to be no useful anomaly in these theories. However, if we look at the global anomalies, then it turns out that there exist very useful global anomalies. So it turns out that they have, first of all, they have what is called one home symmetry, uh, which is called center symmetry. I will uh, review this center symmetry in my uh, lectures later. And there, and then the theories have a mixed anomaly between the one home center symmetry and the discrete symmetry. Here, discrete symmetry is a time reversal symmetry for pi Amir's theory. And this is axial symmetry for super Yamir's theory. So anyway, there is a mixed anomaly between one form symmetry and some discrete symmetry. Then the existence of uh, this uh, subtle center symmetry and the anomaly implies that the discrete symmetries, that is time reversal or axial symmetry, must be broken after confinement. But here, I have to neglect some more exotic possibilities. But basically, uh, I believe uh, this is what happens. So discrete symmetries must be spontaneously broken. So in this, so I will review this uh, later. So in this way, uh, we can <coughs> get an interesting relation between the concept of confinement and the symmetry breaking. 
even in these p i a m theories and n equal one super m theories. And more surprisingly, this subtle anomaly can even constrain the finite temperature phase transition. So this, this is the recent development. This, was, this is very interesting. And this was found by Guy Otto, Kapustin, Kumagodsky, and Seiberg. Uh, so the usual continuous symmetry cannot constrain, cannot give any useful constraint on finite temperature phase transition. But uh, these more subtle anomalies can give some useful information also about finite temperature. So I want to discuss uh, these topics later. So I will review uh, more details of these topics. But before going to that, let me summarize the overview. The concept of symmetries and anomalies are organized and generalized in recent years. And they are very useful for the studies of strong dynamics. And also, they are very important in string theory. String theory has very extremely subtle and sophisticated topological structures related to anomaly. And I believe that uh, there's much more to be investigated in this, in both of these directions. OK, so uh, this is the end of the overview. And uh, I want to use the whiteboard from now on. I'd like to discuss the specific topic related to uh, some gauge theory. <coughs> and I focus on the topological aspects of gauge theories. And the plan is as follows. <laughs> ah, harder? OK. Uh, okay. First, uh, I will discuss uh, one form symmetry. Ah, sorry, sorry. Not one form symmetry. Yeah, oh, sorry, one form symmetry. I want to discuss one form center symmetry uh, in gauge theories. So, this one form center symmetry is an important concept of, to consider about confinement in gauge theories. So, I discuss it, and then uh, I discuss anomalies of these center symmetries. And their applications, which I mentioned uh, in the overview. And maybe I don't have time, but uh, if there is time, uh, I also want to discuss some Variants of center symmetry. This center symmetry does not always exist, uh, but uh, even in such a case, there exist some variants of center symmetry, which is very useful. And this is uh, related to the global structure of a uh, global symmetry group. But maybe I don't have time to explain 
this last topic. So let me just mention the uh, uh, following. Uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, we basically learned that uh, SO, SU2 and SO3 are almost uh, equivalent, at least the level of algebra. But in the study of uh, uh, topological properties of gauge theories and global anomalies and so on, it, it is important that uh, we distinguish them. So SU2 is not equal to SO3. Then uh, we can get uh, more information. <laughs> Here this SU2 and SO3 are some global symmetry groups. So the message about this uh, third topic is that uh, uh, it is helpful to distinguish SO3 and SU2. Okay, so first, uh, I so I want to discuss basically this center symmetry. But before going to the center symmetry, uh, I discuss higher form symmetry in general. So let's consider quantum field theory in quantum field quantum field theory in d dimensional manifold. Then first, uh, let me repeat what I said uh, in the overview. In the case of continuous symmetry. And continuous zero form symmetry. This zero form symmetry means that just means the usual symmetry. So zero form is usual symmetry, and one form, two form, three form are more generalized symmetries. So in this case of continuous zero form symmetry, uh, we just have conserved current, which I represent as a as a one form. Then I can take the Hodge dual of this uh, one form, and this is d minus one form. <coughs> then charge can be defined by uh, integrating this d minus one form <coughs> over uh, some d minus one dimensional submanifold. So this subscript means uh, the dimensionality of uh, the submanifold. <coughs> and from here we can define the symmetry operator. And also the charge conservation is uh, del mu j mu equal zero. This is the charge conservation. And this is just the, this can be just written as a, this is proportional to the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual of the current. So current conservation means that this uh, uh, Hodge of the current is closed. And <clears throat> therefore, this, Q, this, char, this charge operator depends only on the topology.
So this is, I hope, very easy. <coughs> and in the case of discrete symmetry, discrete, or discrete zero form symmetry, for example, discrete symmetry means something like uh, Zn. Yeah, we can also consider some non-abelian uh, discrete symmetries, but uh, in today's talk, I just uh, uh, consider abelian discrete symmetries. So for, for example, we can consider Zn, Then there is no current, no conserved current, but, but still uh, there exists uh, this symmetry operator. Uh, maybe I use alpha. Uh, for, for each group element. And this operator is also invariant under the continuous deformation of, of this surface, d minus one, d minus one dimensional surface. So this is a <coughs> case of discrete symmetry. Then from, from this uh, continuous zero form symmetry and uh, discrete zero form symmetry, it's easy to generalize uh, these symmetries to higher form symmetries. So in the case of continuous symmetry, um, we can just put uh, many indices to the current operator. So zero form symmetry uh, has just one index on the current, but we can increase the number of uh, indices. So, so let's consider continuous, continu continuous uh, p form symmetry. Conserved current is given like this. So it has P plus one indices. And I assume that uh, these indices are anti-symmetric. So they can be described by P plus one form. So if the uh, indices are not anti-symmetric, then it is more difficult. That is called higher spin symmetries. And I don't discuss uh, the case of higher, uh, higher spin symmetries. <clears throat> I just discussed the case that they are described by differential forms. Then they can be described uh, in a very similar way to the zero form symmetries. So we can consider the Hodge dual of the current, and if we take the exterior derivative, then it is zero. So this is the conservation equation. So this is completely parallel to the case of zero form symmetry. And
and we can also define charge. Now, charge is defined on dimension d minus p minus 1 uh, submanifold. We take such a submanifold and we integrate uh, 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 this Hodge dual over such submanifold. So this is just simple dimensional counting. So I took this conserved current uh, to be uh, p plus one form. Then if this is p plus one form, the Hodge dual of this current is d minus one, uh, d minus p minus one form. So uh, we have to take uh, d minus p minus one submanifold to uh, integrate it. Then this charge is defined on each of such uh, submanifolds. And uh, <coughs> the conservation equation means that uh, this uh, charge is, charge depends only on the topology of this submanifold. So if we take two topologically distinct uh, submanifolds, then we get uh, different charges. So <clears throat> in the case of uh, Lorentz signature space time, uh, Usually, the zero form symmetry charge exists by integrating over the entire time slice. But uh, these higher form symmetries can be integrated uh, over topologically distinct uh, spatial submanifolds. So it is possible that uh, we can get many, uh, many charges. Uh, by integrating of uh, different topological, uh, topologically different uh, submanifolds. And in quantum field theory, uh, these higher form symmetries may look very exotic, but in string theory, they are very common. I believe that you are familiar uh, with uh, D brains. So, example is that the string theory D brains. Well, D P brains. So they have a charge under uh, p-form symmetry. So I believe you are familiar with this. And these DP brains are coupled to Ramon Ramon P plus one form fields. So these Ramon Ramon fields are the uh, gauge fields for these higher form symmetries. So P form symmetry is very common in string theory. And uh, maybe I should make a remark uh, that more precisely, uh, D brains are described by uh, K theory. So these P-form symmetries are described by some usual cohomology theory. Uh, but uh, more precisely, uh, these uh, DP, DP brain charges are described by what is called generalized cohomology theory. And in particular, in the case of this D brain, we have to use K theory, which is a more uh, advanced uh, topological concept, but I neglect uh, 
uh, these things. <coughs> so these higher form symmetries are very familiar uh, if you are familiar with string theory. <coughs> Then, conceptually, it is not so difficult to generalize it to uh, discrete uh, p form symmetry. So, again, in this case, because the symmetry is discrete, <coughs> there's no uh, conserved current. Uh, but we have uh, this symmetry operator defined on dimension d minus p minus one uh, sub manifold. And this is also labeled by uh, some group element. And practically, I only consider uh, some Zn discrete symmetry groups. So uh, this label is an element of this Zn uh, symmetry group. And again, there's example. So, so example is that, so here this DP, by this DP brain, I mean the usual uh, BPS DP brains, but uh, there's some non-BPS uh, DP brains. These non BPS DP brains, so they don't satisfy the BPS bound, but they are known to exist uh, because they are stable. They are stable because they have uh, discrete charge and a higher form symmetry. So, so discrete uh, P form symmetry is also common in string theory. They, they often appear. And again, more precisely, uh, these non-BPS DP planes are described by K theory. So K theory uh, unifies uh, this continuous charge and discrete uh, higher form charge. Uh, but I neglect uh, uh, these points. So, so luckily speaking, uh, there exist DP planes uh, which has discrete P-form symmetry and therefore they are stable. So they are very common, but uh, uh, they are very common in string theory, but uh, these higher form symmetries are also very convenient in uh, just quantum field theory. In the context of quantum field theory, uh, we consider operators uh, so, usually we consider some local operators. Uh, local operator means that uh, operator depends on the position of the space time. Uh, and these local operators are charged under the zero form symmetry, usual symmetry. But uh, we can also have some uh, operators uh, which are extended in space time. And the extent operators can have charges under the higher form symmetry. So let me denote the operator by O. And this is defined on some submanifold. This
This is an operator. Defined on defined on p dimensional submanifold. So if p equals zero, then this is this sp is just a, uh, a point. So this is just a local operator if p is equal to zero. But uh, we can also consider operators uh, which are defined on p dimensional submanifolds. And there's a uh, very familiar example of this, uh, these kinds of operators. So example is a Wilson loop operator. Wilson loop operator is just a, I denote the Wilson loop by W. This is just a trace of exponential of integral of gauge field. Uh, this is integrated over some, uh, so in, in this case, let me denote the submanifold as, uh, as C. So this C is a loop in space time. So we can define Wilson loop operator by integrating gauge field over, uh, <coughs> over some loop in space time. So in this case, this loop C is a, is a one dimensional submanifold. So this is an example of extended operator. And I will later argue that uh, this Wilson loop operator is charged under the one form center symmetry. So this Wilson loop is the most important example. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes. Ah, higher form gauge field. Uh -huh. uh, uh, sorry, I, it depends on your question. So, if we so this this gauge field is uh, gauge field or something like G A uh, S U N or some something. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, if. If the theory contains two form gauge fields, then we can extend it to, uh, for example, string theory, Ramon Ramon fields can be integrated over some, yeah, P, P plus one, mm -hmm. dimensional manifold. Yes. Uh -huh. So then we exponentiate it. Then this defines an operator. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm. <laughs> yes. Uh, why is that a p-form symmetry? Because I don't see a p-form there. Discrete p-form symmetry. Uh, discrete p-form symmetry and uh, uh, sorry, p why? Why sorry? Why? What does it have to do with a p-form? Which one? This dp brain. So the symmetry appears in the dp brains. That's the reason. Yeah, uh, what I mean is that uh, string theory, so this 10 dimensional string theory uh, has some discrete higher form symmetries. They are dynamical symmetries, but anyway, they have discrete higher form symmetries, and this DP, non BPS DP brains has charges under uh, that uh, discrete P form symmetry. That's a statement. The symmetry exists in 10 dimensions. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. I think uh, maybe uh, I have also seen uh, like, like a continuous P forms, you have a P plus one form. Charge, uh, current. But uh -huh. uh, here, is there, there is no J charge or current. So, There's no charge, yeah, yeah. yeah. So why, why you call it form? So that maybe. Uh, why? Because uh, the charged object, uh, uh, name, you mean this form? Yeah, just uh, just, this is, sorry, this is just name. Yeah, sorry. So, um, yeah. 
This is just a terminology <laughs> in the literature. So, um, yeah. So more precisely, we have to introduce terminology from cohomology theory, but uh, physicists like uh, differential forms, so that's why we use this form. Um, so most precisely, this is described by K theory. So, um, so more precise statement is that um, oh, I forgot. Type two B has uh, some symmetries whose charges are described by K theory of ten-dimensional space-time. So this is the statement. And uh, so you are asking the reason, reason why? So why, did, why is that in the ordinary term? Like say, you mentioned ZN uh, for, for this non-BPS DP brains. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is the, the actual group? Um, uh, why do I discuss ZN? Uh, so this K theory, K theory contains some some element like Z, actually Z, Z2. So, sorry, sorry, this should be two, so in this example. So, because, so this K theory contains Z2 and Z, and this Z is uh, usual uh, stable BPS D planes. So, this Z part describes the charges of uh, BPS D planes. And this Z2 part describes uh, uh, charges of non-BPS uh, D planes. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, and so, Generally, these uh, extended operators uh, are charged under uh, higher form symmetries. So let's take sigma and sigma prime. They are both d minus d minus one uh, submanifold. And then let's take, uh, let's suppose that they are boundaries of some D minus B uh, dimensional submanifold. Then, so, ah, uh, okay, so let me write the situation. So suppose the situation is like this. So we have two surfaces, sigma prime and sigma. And then suppose that between these two surfaces, uh, we have uh, this submanifold uh, SP, S sub B, uh, S sub B, on which the operator is located. So let's consider this situation. Then. This sigma prime and sigma bounds the region which I denote by this T. This is a D minus B dimensional submanifold. And let's assume that the intersection number of this T and S is equal to one. So let's consider this kind of uh, geometric situation. So this intersection number means that the number of intersection, roughly speaking, of this uh, SP and D, uh, T, uh, D minus B. 
So they generically they intersect on points. And I'm here assuming that they intersect only on a single point. Then in this situation, um, so in this situation, if we sandwich this extended operator by the symmetry operators in this way, So this this point is is SP is and this bulk is bulk is this T sub D minus P. Mm. Then if we sandwich this operator by these symmetry operators, then then the operator transforms under the symmetry in this way. Here you, this u, this u alpha is uh, some representation. Representation of the symmetry group. For example, if the symmetry group is just Zn, then this is just exponential of uh, 2 pi i over n, or well, something like that. So this must be also familiar in the case of uh, zero form symmetry. So in the case of zero form symmetry, this is just local operator. Uh, then if we sandwich local operator by some, uh, these symmetry operators, then the operator transforms in the representation of the symmetry group. So that is very familiar in the case of zero form symmetry. And this, this is just a generalization of that situation to the higher form symmetry case. So it's just that uh, geometrically it's a little bit complicated, but essentially uh, the essential idea is uh, completely the same. And, and as I mentioned uh, in the overview, so if we have p home symmetry, we can couple them to background fields. And I change the notation. I, I change. Uh, I denote the background field by B uh, from now on. For continuous p form symmetry, uh, it's very easy to couple uh, the background field to the uh, to the theory. So. So in the case of continuous symmetry, we just uh, multiply this background field and the current operator, and then we integrate over the space time. So this is very easy. <clears throat> and also this is very familiar uh, from the uh, string theory. So DP brains are coupled to Ramon Ramon fields uh, in this way. <coughs> but in the case of discrete symmetry, uh, it becomes more abstract. Uh,
So in the case of a discrete symmetry, we need some more abstract approach. And one way to think about uh, how to think about this discrete background field for discrete symmetry is as follows. So we consider insertion of operator, the symmetry operator in the path integral. This operator U. Then this insertion of this operator itself can be regarded as a kind of background field. So what that means is that um, if we take this background field to be some delta function localized on the surface, Yeah, this is delta function. And this alpha is the parameter here, alpha, pitch level is the operator. Then, roughly speaking, uh, uh, insertion of the operator corresponds to uh, coupling to this uh, localized background field. So, uh, one way to think about the coupling to the discrete background field is to insert this operator. So that, that's a concrete way. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for uh, the normal continuous zero form symmetries, the way how we see this is a symmetry, I mean, when the Lagrangian is invariant on the certain transformation, we can say that the uh, theory has a symmetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the higher form symmetry? How can you see, I mean, yeah, what is more, the conditions? Yeah, 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 yeah. it's certain, more difficult, yeah. Uh, and the condition is that, uh, I believe that the general condition is that uh, this operator depends only on the topology of this uh, sigma, this surface. Yeah, so the, the topological invariance characterizes uh, symmetry because, because, because if, if this only depends on the topology, then that means uh, the charge is conserved. We can deform it and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so con concretely, uh, we can consider the coupling to uh, discrete background fields as an insertion of operator. Yes. So here, uh, I guess the, uh, these two problems, not just one problem, solve the observation manifold of sigma and the sigma and which? Here, BP plus one. Is a defined maybe on maybe SP. D, oh, oh, hmm? So you are so talking about this. You are yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the, that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, so according to there, PP plus one is living on SP, while sigma is a kind of a two boundary. And yeah, they are yeah. completely separated. Mm -hmm. And why you say that this is a coupling? Why do I say this is coupling? Coupling. Uh, so in what sense they are two fields are coupled? Or BP plus one is living on the entire 
I mean the manifold, the, the, which is not confined on SP. I mean, so let's just uh, substitute this delta function to, to this one. Then, then we get the uh, we get the integral of the current over this over this uh, sigma. So, so this is the charge uh, alpha times Q. So, at least in the case of Continuous symmetry, uh, this delta function background field corresponds to the insertion of this operator. So then by reversing it, uh, we may consider inserting this operator as an introduction of background field. Sorry. Did you assume that BP plus one is proportional to delta function on sigma? Yes, yes. Ah, not on SP. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, so, so yes, yes. This is a delta function localized. Uh, localized. Localized on uh, sigma. Yes, yes. What about the sigma prime? Sigma prime, uh, no, 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 uh, I mean, if we insert the operator with, which is localized on sigma, then that corresponds to the background field localized on sigma. I, I mean, there's no sigma prime in, in this statement. I see, I see. So in principle, P is uh, living on the entire space. Okay, in principle, okay. Thank you. Uh, so I've got a question here. Uh, so when we are um, integrating this uh, char uh, I mean current on the surface sigma, are we implicitly assuming that sigma is oriented? Ah, sigma. Okay. So here, I for simplicity, I'm assuming orientation. Yeah. Um, yeah. If if sigma is not oriented, then yeah, I mean, in that case, that case also happens. In, for example, in string theory, but uh, uh, for example, in that case, we have to use some cohomology with twisted coefficients. Uh, that's an abstract concept, but there, there is a way to treat such a case also. But here, for simplicity, I assume orientability of these. Sub manifolds and all the manifolds. So, so if we are not so familiar with cohomology theory, uh, you can just consider the coupling to background field as an insertion of this the operator. But uh, more abstractly. Uh, Uh, let me just mention that uh, the necessary mathematical data are the following. So, so I introduced this uh, d minus p minus one dimensional manifold and parameter alpha, uh, but more mathematically, they have to be described by uh, some homology element homology element on the manifold with the coefficient uh, g. And here I'm assuming that this d is abelian. And this background field, uh, p plus one from background field, is uh, this takes values in uh, cohomology with g coefficient. 
So this is the most general uh, background field uh, which can be coupled to this P plus one form symmetry with symmetry group G. Um, and this concept of homology theory with G coefficient is very abstract. So maybe you are not familiar with it. Uh, but under some simplifying assumption, uh, we can represent them by just differential forms. So assume assume that there is no torsion in uh, homology or homology. I don't explain what torsion is. Um, for example, uh, simple manifolds like uh, torus and sphere and complex projective space, they don't have torsion. But the real projective spaces have torsion. Uh, so for technical simplicity, let's assume that there is uh, no torsion in cohomology. So if you don't know what torsion is, then please neglect this comment. But if there is no torsion, then this HP plus one, then uh, this cohomology group is just represented by closed differential forms. That means this B sub P plus one is just a differential form which is closed. If we act exterior derivative, then this is zero uh, up to exact form. So this is just what is called the Durham theorem. So if there is no torsion in the manifold, these cohomology groups can be represented by uh, differential forms. And physicists are more familiar with uh, differential forms. So maybe it's better to consider <coughs> them as a differential form if you are not familiar with uh, algebraic topology. So for example, if the group G is Zn, then, then the integral of these background fields are just integers. But if the group is uh, this Zn, then this integer has meaning only modulo n. So uh, we can take such differential forms and regard them as a background field. Frame, frame, do I, ten, ten minutes, okay. And these fire form symmetries can be dimensionally reduced to lower dimension. <laughs> so suppose 
shows that the space-time manifold is some S1 times some another manifold. So, so this means we consider some S1 compactification of the space-time manifold. Then, then we can consider dimensional reduction on this S1 and then we go to a lower dimensional effective field theory. So this M is D dimension, this L is, this L is D minus one dimension. Then P form symmetry, P, P form symmetry becomes um, the sum of P minus one form plus uh, P form. So by using differential forms, uh, you can check that uh, the ho sorry, cohomology group on S1 times manifold L is just given by cohomology group with one degree less uh, plus uh, cohomology group P plus one. So this can be easily checked uh, at the level of uh, differential forms. So this is mathematical statement and uh, the physical consequence is that um, if we have p form symmetry in D dimensions, then after S1 compactification, we get, uh, we get both uh, p minus one form symmetry and p form symmetry. So in the usual symmetry, namely usual zero form symmetry, this p is just zero, so we don't get this p minus one. But in the case of higher form symmetries, uh, we also get this uh, non-trivial factor, p minus one form. For example, if we start from one form symmetry, then after compactification, uh, the one form symmetry becomes one form and zero form. So after compactification, we also get the usual zero form symmetry if we start from one form symmetry. So, so, so in this way, we have to consider generalization. It, it's very convenient to consider generalization. Finally, let me discuss um, spontaneous symmetry breaking of higher form symmetries. <coughs> so usual symmetries uh, can be spontaneously broken, and then we get Goldstone bosons or uh, many vacua and so on. Uh, and in the case of higher form symmetries, that's more subtle. Yeah, honestly, I don't so much understand how to consider spontaneous symmetry breaking, but let me just mention the proposal made in the original paper by, by I forgot so the Kapustin, Willet, Kayoto, Zaiberg. Maybe they are the authors of, uh, of the paper on higher form symmetry. 
So their proposal is as follows. So first we consider all operators which are charged under the uh, higher form symmetry. Ah, sorry, and here I'm discussing the case of just flat space, flat Minkowski space. So first we consider all operators uh, on some sample manifold. Then we see whether the wave of these operators are going to zero. Whether z goes to zero in the limit that the size of, of this submanifold s, the size of s goes to uh, infinity. So S P Ah, sorry, 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 so S P S P S P. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. So in the case of <laughs> usual symmetries, zero form symmetries, this this is just a point, so we don't need to take a limit. Uh, but in the case of higher form symmetries, if we compute uh, these waves in explicit examples, then if the size of this uh, submanifold is finite, then, then we find that uh, this wave is non-zero, actually. But we take the limit that the size goes to, uh, uh, size goes to infinity, very large size, and then see whether this wave goes to zero or not. So it's better to give an example. So example is a Wilson loop. In the case of Wilson loop, there is a area law in confinement phase. So area law means that if we compute the wave of the Wilson loop, then, then it's, it's some constant times the area, area of the uh, surface, which are uh, surrounding the loop. So we take loop C, loop, this is loop. Then we consider the surface which are bounded by this loop. And this area is the area of this surface. And so this behavior is called the area law. And this happens in confinement phase. And if this Wilson loop shows this area law, then if we take the size to infinity, then this goes to zero. And I will later discuss that, uh, maybe tomorrow, I will tomorrow discuss that this Wilson loop operator is charged under one form center symmetry. And, and this area law implies that the one home center symmetry is not spontaneously broken in confinement phase, but it is uh, spontaneously broken in Higgs phase. So this, so this criterion of symmetry breaking, I think, is inspired by this, uh, uh, this case of uh, Wilson loop. Uh, 
Ah, sorry, so, okay, so, if this goes to zero, then, then symmetry is preserved. Okay, so, uh, but, but just, just one more comment. So, but uh, I remark that this, uh, this condition is up to renormalization of operators. So, so usual local operators are renormalized. And in the same way, uh, these loop operators are also renormalized. Uh, depending on the renormalization factors, uh, uh, I mean, if we put some counter terms for, for this operator, then, then the operator variable goes to zero even if the symmetry is spontaneously broken. So, so this condition means that uh, this operator variable goes to zero regardless of the counter terms which are necessary for the renormalization of this operator. But anyway, this is a proposal made by uh, uh, Kapustin, uh, Gaiotto, Zyberg, Willett. Okay, so this concludes the general discussion of higher homosymmetries, and this ends today's lecture.